You, me, and HIFMB. Stories of science and the sea. Hi, hi, everybody. I hope you're all having a nice festive period. And for the festive period leading up to Christmas, I have for you Andrea Franke, who recently published a paper in People and Nature on the UN Ocean Decade and how real-world labs can make a real difference in achieving the outcomes that are um, wanted for the Ocean Decade. We also talk about her move from fisheries biologist uh, in her early days in academia towards being a more interdisciplinary researcher and applying her skills more broadly. And we also chat about how she achieved that move from more specific disciplinary research towards more interdisciplinary research. So without further ado, I give you Andrea Franke. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of the HIFMB podcast. And today I have Andrea Franke. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Yeah? Yeah, I'm always happy to be in Oldenburg. <laughs> Perfect. So so you don't actually live in, in Oldenburg, right? Well, I live uh, in Kiel and in Oldenburg. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I have a um, I have a room here in a house, a very beautiful house with are a garden. Do? Yes. I, I didn't know. Yes. Right. Um, but I'm still having my apartment in Kiel because thought, part of my work is in Kiel. Right. I thought you're still traveling um, and, and then living in, in the van or whatever. Uh, well, I gave up on that Okay. in autumn. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Makes sense. It's cold. Yep. And there's an energy crisis. Okay. Um so today, wh why are you here? Um, if, first, 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 uh, sorry, first of all, you're a postdoc at HIFMB, yes. and um, you you just recently, I think it's fresh off the press, uh, brought a paper out on the UN Ocean Decade, um, or on on real world labs. Um, so it's called uh, it's a it's a mouthful, but it's a it's a lot to unpack. So it's making the UN Ocean Decade work. Uh, the potential and challenges for interdisciplinary research and real-world laboratories for building towards ocean solutions. Yeah. Yes. Tra even transdisciplinary. Even trans. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry. What did I say? Inter. Inter. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but that's already perfect start. Yeah. Because many. I know you have the difference. They were super funny that that happened to you now yeah. because uh, a lot of people don't have this difference very clear because it is uh, rather complex. Yeah. No. I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I know. Freudian slip. <laughs> no worries. Whoops. Yep. Uh, okay, so, so it just came out in uh, People in Nature. When, yes. when did it come out? Like uh, just on Monday. Yeah, Monday. Yeah. Yes. Big day. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, yeah, I'm very happy that it came out, right? It was a lot of work. It took a long time because uh, like we it. were quite a few authors and uh, many of them, most of them, uh, very busy. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we went to one uh, revision and uh, that's the second version, so to say, that's published. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it took a while, as usual, with publications. I'm very happy that's finally out there. Yeah. 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 Are you happy with the final version? Yes, I'm very happy with the yeah. final version. I'm uh, way happier with the final version than the first version, as it should be. Yeah. Um, the reviewers honestly did a great job. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it can be a little dis destroying sometimes, right, to yeah. get uh, reviews. And it was, it was tough, but I have to admit that mostly they were right. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we did uh, implement most of the things that they were asking us for, almost all, I have to say. Yeah. And it changed the uh, um, paper quite a bit. The mm -hmm. structure, how we started, the introduction and everything. Um, so honestly, uh, the, if reviews, if review processes, they can be tough and long, but um, it can be quite a good experience in the end. Yeah. Because you really feel that because of this perspective from, from outside, mm -hmm. things are getting actually really better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so you spoke about the team there for a yeah. bit. Um, what's... Um, who are the main players on, on this paper? I mean, it's a long list. Uh, so, yeah, it's a long list. So maybe I, c I should say that um, here at HIFMB, we have the project CREATE, mm -hmm. which is a DAM mission uh, project, um, or BMBF funded, yeah. and uh, or DAM. It yeah, depends uh, also yeah. on who you ask. Deutsche, uh, German, Allianz, German Deu Deutsche Allianz Meeresforschung. Yes, okay. Exactly. And uh, um, BMBF is funding these projects and, yeah, uh, I was uh, back then involved in the proposal writing of CREATE mm -hmm. and CREATE um, uh, aims to work in real world labs mm -hmm. or living labs as they call them if I recall correctly yeah, I so. and after the pre-proposal was submitted to the BMBF um, Helmut came up with the idea to write a manuscript about marine real world labs mm -hmm. or marine living labs and um, 
so the co-authors are not all of them um, but most of them i think almost all of them apart from geisha they are all involved in create create mm -hmm. so i hope i think geisha is not involved in create i'm not i'm not even 100 percent sure but the other ones most of them are uh, are involved in create right okay. and that's why um i had this fantastic opportunity to work with an uh, with a team of interdisciplinary researchers because mm. they are all coming from different fields and um it was an excellent opportunity and when helmut asked me if I want to do that I was like of course yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. perfect yes so yeah and, and a perfect time to be doing it because we are right now in the UN ocean decade yeah um, can you give us a brief rundown of what that is so the ocean decade um, has just started in, uh, in 2021 yeah um, it was prepared for a long time, of course, but it was launched last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Ocean Decade is short for United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, this decade is about science and it's about uh, creating inter- and transdisciplinary science um, to overcome certain challenges that we have and work towards certain outcomes that the decade uh, is hoping or wishing for. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and what are those outcomes? What are um, so there are in total 10 challenges. Okay. And um, for example, to sustainably feed the global population and um, others. And the outcomes are to have, for example, a clean ocean, a healthy ocean, mm -hmm. a resilient ocean. Um, and also what I like uh, a lot, a safe ocean and an inspiring and engaging ocean as well. Mm -hmm. So you have in total uh, seven outcomes. Seven outcomes. That and they're they, working towards. Yeah. yeah. And they have to be read or, or they want to reach them by 2030. Yes. Yeah. Preferably, yeah. yeah so, the, so, so, so the decade ends in 2030. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the question is, how do they want to do that? And um, if people really are interested in, in the ocean decade, they could look it up. Um, of course, you can look it up online, but you can uh, check there. It's called um, Ocean Decade Action Framework. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, in fact, you get a better idea of how it's, how it's organized. Right. So um, the objectives are obviously to create knowledge and um, to overcome the challenges uh, um, like ocean pollution and the overuse of ocean and then have these outcomes and they want to do that by uh, launching decade ac actions and um, these actions are have already started last year mm -hmm. so these actions are um, uh, projects that uh, you can apply for to get funding yeah okay yeah Okay, so and and you're doing this uh, via the use of, of real world laboratories in in this paper. No, well, okay. <laughs> so I can see already that the title is already has already so much information. Maybe we should. Yeah, have, I know. Exactly. Maybe we should have gone for something uh, shorter. So what I what I try to explain is that um, the ocean decade, of course, is a um, it's a gigantic endeavor, right? Mm -hmm. the, the vision of the ocean decade is. Uh, the science we need for the ocean we want mm -hmm. and um, then the question is how do we get there how mm -hmm. do we get to what we want yeah. and um, how do we even decide what we need because uh, obviously different people mm -hmm. have different needs yeah so it's a very uh, you know precise slogan very compact but uh, if you think about it a little it's not really um, trivial at all trivial at all because mm. it uh, um, the V already implies that um, everybody should be involved in this process, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you, as I just said, uh, um, read a little about the ocean decade and get a little into it, you see that uh, it's rather complex mm -hmm. and that it's very challenging and uh, it won't be easy to achieve these outcomes. Um, so we ask ourselves, uh, how could you get there? Mm -hmm. So how could you create transformative knowledge? How could you work in an inter and transdisciplinary manner? Mm. So uh, and because create coming back to this project uh, aims to set up real world labs mm -hmm. and this all is rather new. We thought like, yeah, these real world labs, actually, <coughs> they could be very helpful um, uh, um, using them in these ocean um, decade actions. Mm -hmm to uh, work towards the goal and outcomes that they that they're wishing for mm -hmm. and who's who's so in so yeah. in the end it's an 
uh, long story short, the yeah. Rebuild Lab is a transdisciplinary research method. Okay. And then the problem is already that uh, then the next question most people ask, what mean, what does transdisciplinary mean? Right? Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, transdisciplinary means that you, um, apart from working uh, with different disciplines, together mm -hmm. with different disciplines, which is called then interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. you also involve other stakeholders. And mm -hmm. that could be literally everyone that um, for a certain research question, because after all it's a research method, um, that you know that people and parties and organizations, you need to answer certain questions. So mm -hmm. this could be... Um, uh, government agencies or NGOs or the co that could be the industry or um, individual people like like fishers and so on and so forth. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wrote this beautifully in the in the paper, I think, uh, or in the abstract. Uh, you say that it's the involvement of everyone with stakes in the future of exactly. the marine environment exactly. and its resources. Exactly. It's, yeah. Perfect definition. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so these are the actors involved in a real world lab. Yeah, so you would, if you if you have a certain research question that you want to work on, um, you would, uh, first of all, start with a stakeholder mapping and you would involve everyone that um, is necessary and uh, meet mm -hmm. together. And the interesting thing is that you don't really formulate your research question just with researchers just by yourself. Yeah. You have an idea, of course, a problem you want to solve, something you want to achieve. That has to be a little more specific than um, a healthy ocean because mm. you can <laughs> <laughs> just rescue an entire ocean, world ocean by yourself. Yeah. Um, but then you would meet with these parties and you would discuss the research uh, question and um, really come up with a question and a goal mm -hmm. together with okay. everyone. Yeah, and of course that takes much more time um, compared to traditional research um, where like you and me, we would meet, we would be like, ah, let's run this project. Mm -hmm. I do some experiments, you analyze the data, we write a paper, right? Yeah, yeah. This is uh, um, pretty much v very straightforward mm -hmm. and um, uh, transdisciplinary projects are just much more time consuming, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. And, yeah, and the communication has to be a lot more uh, open and a lot more clearer and uh, yeah, how do you communicate between the different parties effectively? Well, the, the thing is um, that as scientists, it, at least if you're from the, di uh, from the same discipline, mm -hmm. you know what you're talking about. Yeah. Then you, you don't even have to think about transdisciplinary research. I think the problem starts already if you work um, truly interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. that if you have people from different um, disciplines, mm -hmm. certain terms can mean honestly different things yeah. and you can have a lot of misunderstandings and and then things just become you need some patience and some some energy and also to accept other people's views and to be open for them mm -hmm. not everyone is so interested in and in, and in, in, you know talking to the entire world some people just want to do their research which is, which is absolutely fine yeah. because you need fundamental basic research to um to produce you know facts and knowledge mm -hmm. and um, yeah communication i'd say between different scientists uh, um, <laughs> according to my own experience can be already really tricky yeah. <laughs> because you have your jargon you know and other people they um yeah they feel like this means something completely different you know yeah. and then if you want to involve people with a totally different background like from ngos or or um from governments or so, uh, and so on then of course communication will just be much uh, or way more tricky so mm. to say right yeah. so um, i think it will take a while uh, until uh, people then really understand what we're all talking about and what we want to work uh, towards and, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I would say communication is uh, is key and in order to, and I guess there will be, it's normal to have misunderstandings, mm -hmm. but then you just need the time to work through it, right? Yeah. Yeah. How long, do, do, do you have like a brief time fr or, or a, a rough time frame of, of how long a real world lab um, 
takes usually for a decision or for a, to come up with an intervention? You know, the thing is that um, we suggest uh, real world labs or some people also call them living labs mm -hmm. uh, for the marine environment, so marine real world labs. Yeah. Um, but in fact, uh, to my knowledge, there are already some and we are mentioning some mm -hmm. examples, of course. Um, there's, uh, for example, here at the University Gute Küste and there's real, real, world, real world labs mm -hmm. uh, in all these um, DRM projects. Mm -hmm. um, because there is more than create and they are working in the real world labs mm -hmm. but uh, all in all um, we had the feeling that in the marine uh, realm it's it's a rather new method yeah okay. um, so real world labs or living labs are much more common in urban planning for example they have a longer history there also in other terrestrial research uh, fields mm -hmm. but in marine science it seems to be rather new and i know from create and other projects that are setting up rebuild labs that these projects are running for three four years right so mm. that's the time frame that you have to work in a real world lab and it sounds maybe long but i have to say this is honestly i feel it's rather short because yeah. i don't know from your research but i know from from my research during my phd three years pass by in yeah. a heartbeat right yeah, absolutely. because things um, before you have organized your research and if you work experimentally as I did things can simply go wrong uh, statistics are never easy then you publish you don't maybe the vision goes wrong or you so you don't publish yeah. <laughs> so you get rejected <laughs> and so uh, three years is, is not a long time and if you then consider that you first have to do a stakeholder mapping so first you have to um, uh, find all these people that you want to work with together mm. and then go through the entire process I've, I've i think it's rather short yeah but so this will take um depending on the question you want to answer that might take several years yeah, yeah. is a question that you want to answer in in this case of the of the ocean decade linked to the to the decade outcome so you have one question for each outcome or um is it completely different so what we are doing in the paper is that we are discussing the societal challenges that we are all facing trying to work towards ocean sustainability and uh, we especially focus on ocean governance and the blue economy uh, because we feel that real world labs could be feasible opportunity to develop um, more dynamic marine governance goals and they could also help to transform the blue economy which is often not sustainable if you think, for example, about overfishing or unsustainable aquaculture practices. And these things, an improved ocean governance and a more sustainable blue economy, they're of course needed to achieve the um, overarching uh, ocean decade outcomes of a clean, healthy and productive ocean. No, exactly. But you yeah. also, in uh, on page six of the, of the paper, you give this um, really, really cool, very uh, summarizing figure. Yeah. Um, Exactly. That, that pretty much shows the the process of how it's exactly. how, how it's working. Yeah. Um, and yeah. yeah, and exactly. So so we put uh, this figure together after um, a paper written by um, Vanna et al. in mm -hmm. 2018. So they describe the method of real world labs, mm -hmm. and uh, it has three uh, steps: co-design, co-production, and co-evaluation. And we just put it in the um, the context of uh, the o of ocean related issues and um, what you could address and what you could achieve mm -hmm. that so people can't see the <laughs> graph at the moment obviously yeah, exactly but um, so the method was out there and we just uh, used um, uh, the framework that was already developed um, mm -hmm. by Vanna et al and put it in marine context and what you can see easily in the middle of this graph if people want to read the paper maybe yeah you know, <laughs> definitely look you, at the figure uh, you see that a real world lab is about science practice interaction right mm -hmm. so you have natural and social scientists uh, so interdisciplinary um, uh, uh, people and you have practitioners on the other side which are stakeholders all kind of stakeholders that for your question would be relevant and you meet together as i said you co-design your research question you co-produce knowledge and that's uh, in an interesting part i find because um you don't produce knowledge alone anymore as a scientist mm -hmm. you try to you know yeah. do that together with other people exactly. that also have um, ideas and um, a certain background and a certain knowledge yeah. coming back for uh, 
for example, to fishers. Why am I coming back to that? Because I'm a fishery scientist by training. Yeah. <laughs> um, is fishers know way more than we know about when you can catch where where and when you can catch a certain species and they can i don't know we know a fisher in in, in kiel he has worked uh, on the same spot more or less fishing herring for 50 years mm. so you can learn so so much exactly, and yeah. th these things you can't you cannot find in papers yeah, right you, yeah exactly you can't replicate that in a three-year phd exactly you <laughs> can't you can't and that's um what i love about this uh, whole idea is about uh, that it's about knowledge knowledge exchange mm -hmm. so really people come together and they exchange what they know and uh, and also their uh, maybe their wishes and fears and their ideas or visions of the solution so it's not that i'm telling you how this works right mm -hmm. and uh, after you co-produce some uh, new knowledge then um, you can or in this co-production process what you can do is you can really experiment with different scenarios mm -hmm. so that's also the difference between um any transdisciplinary research method because there's many transdisciplinary research method i mean methods um but what is different in real world labs or what's special about them is that the core of real world labs you have experimentation mm -hmm. so you would experiment together on on certain scenarios and see what's working and what's not working mm -hmm. um in a perfect scenario you sh you 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 could then come to a so-called real world intervention mm -hmm. so this means you actually implement the solution that you've been working on yeah and then that's really a big difference between just doing research for yourself yeah. publish publishing a paper and then go on to the next exactly this is really different mm -hmm. from working on something together and implementing this out there in the real world but potentially so much more impactful yeah exactly yeah. and and um also there's so many more challenges right mm -hmm. if you want to so having something on paper or implementing something is two different yeah. things right so exactly. th that's a big challenge and um, we had a lot of uh, discussion because i'm an experimental biologist we had a lot of discussions with my co-author kim what means real world and what <laughs> means, <laughs> oh. <laughs> what means uh, to experiment in the real world what means to experiment in the, in the lab yeah uh, of course there's a lot of uh, pitfalls and dangers with experimenting and there is a uh, ethical dimension and there's a lot of things you have to consider it's not so easy the idea is to jointly work on things together mm -hmm. and to um to consider all kinds of different um knowledges and cultures and so on mm -hmm and yeah if you work towards a potential solution that may be implemented and if you get to the point then the third uh, um, step would be a co-evaluation mm -hmm. so you evaluate actually and i find this very important and for me it's the most crucial step uh, the third one in, in the entire story because you really check if what you've intended to implement um if that's actually working mm or if not or yeah. maybe um uh, things have changed already um maybe the conditions have changed or other things happened and then um things are just not working and uh, yeah. you realize your solution that's why it's always called potential solution actually <laughs> is not a real solution uh, and then you could go it's a cyclic uh, like a, a concept you could go back to the beginning and start again a co-design a co-production yeah. concept if you have the time <laughs> and the money obviously this takes time then if it's like you you come up with uh or, or you start with the experimentation phase you see if something or first of all you come up with the idea then the experimentation phase then you implement something then you reevaluate if this is actually working go back to the ideas yeah so obviously this takes time yeah yeah it takes, it but takes, it's it yeah. takes a lot of time yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's it, you, yeah it takes a lot of time but uh what is what what I, I love about the idea is that uh, it's about participation mm -hmm. that you know everyone with uh, stakes in the future or in this area yeah um everyone that has stakes in this area or uh, this context uh, could hopefully potentially participate mm -hmm. exactly beautifully summarized yeah <laughs> So if people want to look at the paper, it's uh, in people. It's published in People and Nature. Yes. There's also a, a plain language summary. I, th I yeah. think if they Google you, they will find it quickly. 
Yes, it's. I think it's already on my Google Scholar. Yeah, Google yeah, Scholar. Yeah, and, and it's 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 open access. Um, Twitter open access. Yeah, yeah it's it's open access. Yeah. What I what I really love. That's uh, that's great. And yes, the um, journal asked us for um, plain language summary. I think that's and and it's uh, linked in the paper. There's a link to the plain language summary, mm -hmm. which is nice. Wonderful. Yeah. Sweet. So uh, you mentioned a couple of times now that you are an experimental biologist or fisheries biologist. Yeah. Um, I want to dive into that, into <laughs> your into your academic history, so yeah. to say. So, so first of all, most important thing, where are you from? Um, I was born in Cottbus. Yeah. So I did not grow up by the sea. Yeah. <laughs> um, Me neither. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, yeah. How, how did you get into? Oh, that's a yeah, that's a good question. I think. Um, I started diving at some point and then this kind of sparked. So, so we always spent time at the Baltic Sea. Um, but um, yeah, I started diving at some point and then caught the bug. Yeah. The yeah, ocean yeah. bug. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Same here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, we, we, of course, we went on, on holidays to the Baltic Sea and mm. um, the Baltic Sea has such beautiful beaches. Yeah, right? right? Uh, yes. So underrated. So, yes, so underrated, especially yeah. the further east you go. Like if you go to Usedom or Poland mm -hmm. or whatever, it's it's magnificent, yeah. honestly. And I loved that as a child. My whole family loved it. So we would go often then on vacation to other countries, but often to the, not always, but often to the sea. Mm -hmm. And I started diving when I was like, I think, 16 or 17 or so I yeah, did yeah, a course too. on Gran Canaria yeah. I think the classy holiday yeah. thing right <laughs> only that um, I will never forget the whole course was in a swimming pool of course yeah yeah exactly yes. <laughs> and it was just one final dive mm -hmm. was in the sea mm -hmm. and I found it so fascinating and yeah. so beautiful and I guess it was the same for you and that's um, when I decided that I want to study marine biology mm -hmm. I think it's a classy, yeah. classy thing <laughs> right it's almost the same for me I just started uh, in, a, in a little lake uh, near near Leipzig, uh, that's where I started diving. Yeah. So no sea for me, but okay, okay, yeah, a little a little lake. Um, okay, so you are and and then your academic um, path kind of started in in Kiel, though. Yeah. So yeah. Um, since you can't um, study marine biology <laughs> where yeah, I grew purpose, up, yeah. <laughs> um, I went to Kiel. Um, I could have also gone to Rostock, I suppose, or Hamburg, but yeah, I applied, I, I got a, um, a spot in Kiel. Mm -hmm. mm. And the cool thing was that back then, that's a long time ago, in fact, quite a while, <laughs> um, uh, you could study marine biology or fisheries biology. Oh, right, as, yeah. a, as a diploma. That, that, yeah, yeah. So that ba back then it was a diploma, a diploma, so what's a master now? The master still, the master still exists at Geomar in okay. Kiel. It's called um, biological oceanography right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can still I study this it. master, but um, you cannot uh, specialize in fisheries biology anymore ah, okay. because back then the fisheries uh, uh, biologist, the professor here retired. Mm. He retired shortly after I started to study. So, oh, okay. so for me, that was great because I could still, that means I could still study fisheries right. biology. Yeah, I was yeah, ask, uh, okay. yeah, he just uh, retired later, uh, some years later. And uh, yeah, so I found, I mean, you know, they teach you all kinds of different things. It's about different os uh, ecosystems, uh, benthic organisms and microorganisms and all that. I found it like interesting, of mm -hmm. course, you know, um, but then the fisheries uh, <laughs> class started and I was like, wow, this is super cool. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it from the beginning. I loved this interaction between the sea and and, and humans mm -hmm. i found i uh, found it um fascinating immediately yeah so okay. i'm really interested in uh, socio ecological systems yeah yeah, yeah. we uh, i can tell from your cv it's yeah. uh, it, it speaks social ecological <laughs> yeah yeah so, so yeah so i became a fisheries biologist but then um since uh, people in the department they were all nat natural scientists of course mm -hmm. they were all what means of course Unfortunately, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Back then, in this department, was a bunch of lovely people. They all work in different places now. Yeah. All, um, and um, we were all natural scientists. And um, so I did uh, my master's thesis on the effect of ocean acidification on the development of fish larvae. Mm -hmm. of, of herring, right? Yeah. yeah Atlantic herring. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Herring that we called, caught right there in the, in the Baltic... Uh, in, in the Kiel Canal, in fact, ah, okay. because they, they come to the coast and they go up um, um, the Kiel Canal mm -hmm. and also they come to the fjord uh, and 
back then I went to the fisher that I mentioned already before. Ah, so yeah. you go there he and you get your freshly caught herring, yeah. you strip spawn <laughs> them, you fertilize the eggs and you run your experiment. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. All at the at the harbor. Yeah, all at uh, well you get them from 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 the fisher in, in the in the canal in that case in the yeah. harbor. Yeah. Um and the experiments are were run all at Geomar because they have um, fantastic facilities to mm -hmm. work experimentally. Yeah, yeah, I've heard. I've only seen it from outside, never yeah. from the inside. Yeah, they have the big advantage that they have uh, access to water. Mm -hmm. it sounds simple, but not everyone has access to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> marine water, exactly. Yeah. We, we, we don't. <laughs> and yeah, they have a flow through system. You can use as much water as you need. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, a big kicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big, big advantage. Yeah. So yeah, I started off as an uh, experimental biologist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then yeah, you went to a, a bunch of research cruises in your CV. It says from 2003 to 2014 you went on research cruises. Yeah, yeah. Not every year. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't do that yearly. But yeah, for a while. So um, we have a time series. Juma has a time series every. Um, I don't want to lie. Every April and May, right. they go on two cruises. Mm -hmm. um, where they mainly catch um, a cod um, to do uh, assessments and so they have a time series over many years which is very valuable you don't mm -hmm. have I mean not every institute has such time series and I used to go on these fisheries cruises for a while yeah, yeah. even though it was never really part of exactly the projects I did yeah. but I kept on going and when I started my PhD in aquaculture mm -hmm. I for the first and the second year my supervisors thank you <laughs> <laughs> they still let me go <laughs> even though it had nothing to do with my PhD a, a deep passion for it yeah it was I mean it's um, it's super fascinating, right? Yeah. You're on a research vessel for, for two weeks. We always once went to a harbor, so I've never been on these crazy long research uh, excursions. Like, yeah, me neither. Like three or six weeks, and I'm, I'm also not sure if I could do yeah. it. Yes. I'm, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. So there it's perfect. You're one week, you're just on the water with the crew, and you know, and then you, you go to harbor one night, you see some land, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> then you have another week of, um, of the cruise. And uh, yeah, it's of course, it's extremely fascinating, especially at the beginning, just to be on a ship yeah. away from everything, you yeah. know, back then, I don't, I, when I started, there was no internet or so, but yeah. then it was <laughs> super slow that you couldn't use it. So yeah. you really, you are with a bunch of people mm -hmm. and that's what you do for two weeks. And yeah. uh, it's also out of uh, uh, um, social reasons. It's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Yeah. And then you, you started your PhD in 2012 on uh, aquaculture. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I did my... Um, so I we're still in, in Kiel. Yeah, still yeah. in Kiel, still at Geomar. I did my master's with... My supervisor was Katriona Clemensen. Mm -hmm. And in my PhD, she was still my supervisor, then along with uh, Olivia Roth. And um, yeah, in between the master's and the PhD, I traveled for a while and I worked for a while as a technician in a project. Mm -hmm. so that's why there's such a big gap. And working as a technician was also fascinating. It was fast. I think, yeah, I learned a lot from that because for a while I worked for a scientist. Yeah. As a technician yeah. before I became myself a proper scientist yeah, for yeah. my PhD. I, I think yeah. that. Yeah, it gives you a whole different perspective on, on things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have to say that um, this time was, to be honest, quite enjoyable because you don't have so much responsibility. Mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> not that I, it's not that I didn't take my, my job seriously. On the contrary, I loved it. Mm -hmm. And, I, and um, Christoph, m my boss back then, he was very happy. We were a really good team. Um, but I didn't have the pressure that things had to work out. Yeah. You know, I, I gave my best that it worked. But exactly. um, I was not the one who later had to write the report and hand it into the funding agency and to apply uh, to explain mm -hmm. why things maybe took longer or didn't work out. In the end, everything works out, worked out in that project. The thing is, if you work experimentally, you always have a lot of pressure because um, the animals that you're working with, they can simply die. Mm -hmm. And you have to start from the beginning on. And since projects are always uh, uh, limited in time, that can be a lot of pressure. 
Yeah. Yeah, so um, actually, I, I really enjoyed it. And <laughs> in the end, uh, they hired me as a scientist, even in that project, because we wrote a paper together mm -hmm. on the buoyancy of fish eggs. I will not <laughs> go into <laughs> detail. That was very specific, but very important. Yeah. <laughs> because cod eggs, for example, they have a certain buoy buoyancy. So it's important that they're in a certain area where they can float. And in that area, there should be enough oxygen so they survive. Ah, okay. So that's a lot about hypoxia and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And then I started my PhD um, in, in aquaculture, mm -hmm. in fact, an aquaculture project, um, working some years again with fish larvae, with sea bass larvae, and trying to stimulate the immune system. <laughs> I always have to laugh even <laughs> by myself if I'm saying it, but yeah, so it's a little the idea of, or exactly the idea that you have if you buy probiotic yogurt, for example, uh. or uh, so we try to... Um, stimulates the immune system of fish larvae because when they hatch the immune system is not fully developed yet it's far away from being fully developed mm -hmm. and the mi microbiota plays a big role in the development the gut microbiota especially but also in the gills and so on yeah. uh, plays a big role in, in the development of the immune response so if you influence um uh, this microbiota um in a certain way then you can uh, train the immune system better so to say mm -hmm. and have a better immune response earlier on and hopefully boost the survival rate of fish in aquaculture yeah. of fish larvae in aquaculture so yeah i did that some years of what's my life <laughs> what's the status of, of cod and what was the other one seabass uh, so seabass is an aquaculture um uh, it's a typical aquaculture species ah, okay. i don't know if you go on vacation to spain or portugal one of the fish um, that you can always eat there is sea bass and sea bream right uh, yeah okay yes and yeah. these two um they are mainly from uh, aquaculture ah right yeah most of them will not be wild caught fish yeah okay so the uh, the aquaculture for uh, sea bream and sea bass and um yeah, in Spain and uh, I think also France and Italy and so on. And the Mediterranean is um, is, is working well, so to say. Mm -hmm. It's uh, they they produce a lot of fish. Yeah. That's what I'm talking. It's established. Yeah. That's <laughs> the word I was looking for. Yeah, it's quite established. Thanks to your research. No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't <laughs> think so, but <laughs> maybe some less larvae died due to my research. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's uh, playing a big role. Yeah. So okay, after and after the uh, PhD, you you actually became a, ha had a bunch of roles as scientific coordinator, project manager twice, and and um, is this when when kind of the the interdisciplinarity became a thing for you or? Yes, actually, yeah. actually yes, because so far I was, uh, as I said, I was interested in socio-ecological systems, but the yeah. truth is that I worked very specifically with fish and mm -hmm. not just with fish but with fish larvae. Right. <laughs> so just with one uh, stage in the entire life cycle, right? Yeah. It's, it was very, very specific. Mm -hmm. And I um, in, enjoyed it back then. Um, and maybe I would still do it. I don't know. But uh, then uh, someone was looking for a scientific coordinator mm -hmm. for an ocean health project, so mm -hmm. to say. And I applied and I got the position that was also at GMR. Yeah. And um, in Kiel, um, back then, we had a cluster of excellence, Future Ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that was super interdisciplinary. And uh, yeah. it was, yeah, it, it was really nice to have such a cluster. Um, and the cluster was about to end the sec for the second time already. And they were writing a proposal for the third phase. Mm -hmm. So, mm, of course, then if you want to have a cluster third time, you have to show that what you've been that you've been achieving a lot but that there's a lot of more things to do so you kind of have to reinvent yourself i'd say mm -hmm. so um they had the idea which i think was excellent to write a transdisciplinary proposal yeah um unfortunately that it didn't get funded i think um okay. they were a little ahead of their time to be honest <laughs> and, uh, That's unfortunate. and yeah and also if you um, write inter and transdisciplinary proposals, but your reviewers are all highly disciplinary, mm. then maybe the entire system is also not yeah. perfect. Nice. Anyway, so they came, they wanted to explore new, new research fields and mm -hmm. to see who's doing what in Kiel and what, what could we propose. And um, so I became the scientific coordinator for a while for the topic of ocean health mm -hmm. and i really liked it i got to talk to a lot of people yeah. with different perspectives mm -hmm. with different backgrounds and um what we did um then in the end we organized together with another colleague that was 
um, working on ocean recovery. Mm -hmm. um, we organized a symposium and a workshop and we invited a lot of people from Kiel, of course, but also international people. Yeah. That was just interdisciplinary. That ha was not a transdisciplinary pro um, a process at all, at all. It was a symposium and a workshop, but um, I really enjoyed it. And yeah. it worked out quite well. We, we published a, um, a nice paper i'd say a beautiful paper i really like the ocean health paper yeah with it you in the in the lead right the yeah came yeah. out in 2020 yeah is, is exactly that was the result of the symposium and the workshop and yeah. um we were because you see you before you mentioned that we were quite a few authors for the real world lab mm -hmm. i think for the ocean health paper we were um i'd say almost 20 people oh yeah i can't count that quickly <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's many because we what we did after the symposium so we invited a couple of people they gave a presentation and on the second day we organized a workshop we mm -hmm. organized four workshops so we divided the people into four groups mm -hmm. and that was super helpful later on because those four groups they also worked together writing the proposal mm -hmm. and then everyone was working on their part and then in the end we integrated these parts mm -hmm. And that's why it was uh, possible to do it. I didn't have to talk to all these 20 people all the time. I just needed to talk to one or two of each group, yeah. right? Because they've been working on their on their parts individually. So there was um, the papers, um, not just about ocean health, it's also about the connection between ocean and human health. Mm -hmm. And that's going back to my interest then, right? Yeah, so, yes. Yeah. It was, uh, I, I had some very fascinating um, uh, co-authors that are doing, yeah, for me work that's yeah, yeah. absolutely stunning, yeah. Yeah. I, it's, so do you think that this kind of built your, your interdisciplinary recognition and, and then you were, or from that point, you were more in, interdisciplinarily recognized? Mm, well, you have to ask other people. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> I don't know if if, uh, if I have any if I have this uh, recognition. Honestly, I I, I couldn't tell. But uh, what I can say is that um, I got interested in this mm -hmm. kind of work. So from that moment on, um, I decided that I um, wouldn't want to work on fish um, related topics only. Yeah. You know, so last year, for example, I did another uh, herring larvae experiment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that I don't do that at all anymore. But for yeah. then it was clear that I could, I didn't want to spend all my life experimenting with fish in the lab. You know, only, yeah. only, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 nice. So that was that was then my goal to uh, go more and more towards inter and transdisciplinary um, research. And this ocean health paper is an um, interdisciplinary effort, but since the proposal was supposed to be or it was it it, 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 it proposed transdisciplinary research mm -hmm. we um because there were many different scientific coordinators back then in the cluster mm -hmm. and we learned a lot about transdisciplinary research we yeah. went to conferences and stuff so this position honestly was wonderful yeah. I, I i i learned a lot of fascinating things and um i also enjoyed my phd my you know um nice. but my phd was very specific mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it was c very broad yeah. and yeah i enjoyed that change yeah Did that transition come naturally to you or did you have to work a lot to to make that like from very specific to very broad i'd say very broad is easier for me even is it ah, nice. i think so yeah or, or maybe by now maybe by now okay. I, i used to be i used to be interested in very specific things and then i could read all about a certain gene you mm -hmm. know yeah <laughs> and um i used to be very into details back then in the um, masters and the phd mm -hmm. um But somehow, I'm, yeah, I, I think it was just a natural um, development. Somehow I got less and less interested in things that are super fundamental and super specific. I really got more and more interested in, in broader concepts. And I think this has a lot to do with, um, with this position being a, a um, scientific coordinator. And yeah. um, back <coughs> then, um, we talked a lot about the SDGs. Mm -hmm and uh, about sustainable development and climate change is becoming more and more apparent and um, a bigger problem i don't know if if uh, you know if we wouldn't have this massive threat of climate change and if um, uh, for example so many fish stocks were not overfished if the world was a better place maybe mm -hmm. i would still be in my little climate chamber <laughs> working on you know yeah. uh, gene expression patterns of uh, certain fish larvae mm -hmm. But uh, I have to say, yeah, I, f I, th I think we are facing serious problems and um, it, yeah, 
it's interesting uh, for me to 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 think about these things and to uh, work on them and somehow be a little part of this mm. solution that maybe hopefully we come up with in yeah. the next decades. <laughs> so this is what then led you to here to yeah. uh, HIFMB in 2020. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and but you, I I think I remember your proposal from the beginning. Mm -hmm. it, you, you still work with uh, Herring, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so what brought me here was that. Um, Mm, since I was part of this proposal, big proposal writing for Future Ocean, mm -hmm. mm, I applied. In fact, I think I applied for your position. Did you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about this later, maybe. Whoops, I sorry. think I applied for your position. I'm not quite sure. I didn't get it. Okay. Anyway, I wrote also a proposal for um, the postdoc pool we have here at HIFMB. Mm -hmm. the, the HIP uh, Exactly. Pool. It's, called, yeah. it's called HIP, HIFMB, yeah. HI postdoc pool yeah, hip. hip we are the hips so every <laughs> every year they hire new a new uh, hip cohort and um the proposal i wrote was uh, about climate change effects on um, fish early life stages mm -hmm. so the first thing i did last year was running um uh, going kind of back to the roots to my master's yeah, thesis yeah, exactly, exactly yes. investigating um uh, temperature rise and um, bacteria infections, um, the synergistic effects of both mm -hmm. on the early, very early development after fish larvae, just when they're hatching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I have this RNA seq transcriptome uh, data set and microbiota and whatnot, and I'm still trying to analyze these data. Yeah, okay. So they were sequenced, and then a bioinformatician analyzed them. And now I'm trying to make sense of yeah. the results. Yeah, and on it's, the side, it's, working. A, it's a lot of data. And and um, in the same moment, uh, we wrote this real world lab paper. Exactly. So I'm, yeah. I'm doing both things. Yeah. I'm still doing both things, but um, it's way more interesting yeah. for me by now to think about uh, concepts. You yeah. know, like for example, the ocean health um, uh, paper that we wrote. It was. Um, a lot about what does ocean health even mean. So in, if you see the SDG 14, mm -hmm. it's uh, one of the goals to achieve a healthy ocean by 2020. <coughs> so <laughs> that's a while ago. I think it didn't work, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, one of the outcomes of uh, the ocean decade is again a healthy ocean. Um, but yet, <laughs> if you ask people, people have very different um, uh, opinions or even, uh, yeah, what what does it really mean and uh, definitions and how could and and if you ask how to get there mm -hmm. it's coming even becoming even more complicated because if the goal that you have is rather fuzzy yeah. then it's hard to to decide how to get there because if we if we pursue a certain goal together mm -hmm. but we don't we are not even on the same p page what that actually means mm -hmm. then how do we want to go there and that's what the ocean health paper is about so it's also a lot of about um, communication and understandings yeah. and you know yeah what what things actually mean to different yeah. people so yeah. you kind of already ask uh, at this stage i already i always ask the guests what's next for them i'm actually looking forward to um work um to keep on working with Kim and her group. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. How long is your contract here for, for now? Uh, yeah, it's a stressful topic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> bad, okay. bad end. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, it's it's another year. Okay. Which um, yeah, uh, it's it's always. I think that when the last year is starting, it always feels like I don't know yeah. how you feel about these short term contracts, but not I, great. <laughs> not great, exactly. And at the beginning, I mean. I, I know everyone knows time is flying, you know, and three yeah. years are over no time, but still at the beginning, it's like, it's three years, it's something you can work with. And then um, I think everyone feels different about these things. But for me, this countdown and stress uh, increases when the last year is starting, you know, yeah, like yeah. ding, 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 ding. But I think <laughs> so you've done an excellent job of, of uh, creating, with this paper, creating something really worthwhile here. And, and hopefully we can keep you here. Yeah, that would be excellent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hopefully. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah. Cool. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Is there anything like, um, yeah, we're, we're already but at the 50 minute mark. Uh, is there anything that you feel like we've missed and that you want to add? Or no, 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 no. I want to thank you very much for inviting me. No worries. I, yeah, I was like, oh, wow, you want to talk to me. I don't know if I have to. No, no, it's a perfect time. I mean, this paper. <laughs> yeah, no. Th thank you very much for, for inviting me and for doing this podcast. It's, it's amazing. No worries. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Want to dive deeper? 
surf over to hifmb.de or follow us on Twitter at hifmb underscore ol.